The so-called arc of instability around Australia includes places that can be very pleasant when things are stable, and nowhere more so than Fiji. It was once dubbed the way the world should be, until the rest of the world decided some things here were best avoided. The coup in 2000 and a subsequent mutiny in the ranks of the army were so traumatic they've left a permanent scar on the national consciousness. We kill a need, man! It was Fiji's third coup in 13 years, and the bloodiest. The spectre of a rerun haunts all but the most venal and opportunistic of its 900,000 citizens. Fiji's Prime Minister, Lysania Garase, stunned the nation by saying there was no guarantee the events of 1987 and 2000 wouldn't be repeated. He later claimed to have been misquoted. But while the cameras weren't there, a radio reporter was, and what the Prime Minister said is unmistakable. It was the failure of the leadership of the Labour Party at the time that contributed to the upheavals that we had. There is no guarantee that they will lead our country peacefully into the future. We must have our properties and our homes protected. Uh, this is Dr. Charlie Roger out. Those comments enraged military chief Commodore Frank Vainimarama, so much so that he threatened to jail the prime minister for incitement. Vainimarama had already led his troops through the streets of Suva last month in a none too subtle demonstration of who's really boss in Fiji. Many thought a coup was already underway. The military chief said he and his men were just out for a stroll. We thought we'd take, uh, we come out in public and uh, do what military is supposed to do and take long walks, but at the same time assure the people of Fiji that uh, the military is always around to help protect them. But this was a definite show of force in the continuing battle between the military and the government over the Prime Minister's desire to pardon those involved in the events of 2000. Vaini Marama says that will only happen over his dead body. And after Garasi's coup comments on the weekend, the gloves are well and truly off. When he says there's no guarantee there won't be another coup, what do you make of that as the head of the military? I see that as a threat. I think, uh, I, really, I, I really think that uh, the Commissioner of Police should do something about that statement. He shouldn't be doing this. He's a liar. He's, he is a liar. Uh, he has he's done this continuously from, from day one. He's lied to the people of Fiji by telling them that after being nominated as Prime Minister, who would do the right thing? He did exactly the opposite. He went 180 degrees uh, uh, the other way around. As the military chief tells it, there will be no more coups in Fiji, whatever anyone says, the PM included. We have determined that there will be no coup. If there's any thought of anyone coming up with any, any uh, uh, coup making in, in the next election, they will have to be ready to face the consequences. And singing from the same song sheet is Fiji's police commissioner, Andrew Hughes. The former Australian Federal Police Officer, Canberra provided to help Fiji get back on its feet. We're not going to allow some radical elements to, who decide that uh, you know, they don't like the outcome of the democratic process. They're going to take the law into their own hands and they're going to change it. No, that's not going to happen. Our leader, Mr Mahana Children. That message was never more needed than now. For something extraordinary is happening in Fiji. The elements that produced the 2000 coup are again coalescing in this election. Indigenous extremists pitted against an Indo-Fijian they say they will never tolerate as Prime Minister.
Even the indigenous extremists are conceding that the man most likely to emerge as Prime Minister this time is the man they deposed last time, the Indo-Fijian Mahendra Chowdhury. They're again determined that his reign will be brief. The big difference this time is a military commander equally determined to enforce democracy with the gun. The nationalists are saying they will never accept an Indian Prime Minister. That's what the nationalists say. Now, remember what Will you accept an Indian Prime Minister? We will accept anyone. As I've said, we don't fear anyone, anything from, uh, from the Labour. On the contrary, Bani Marama expresses a preference for Labour. Let me tell you that any, anyone can be a, a better Prime Minister than what we have had in the last five years. For his part, Mahendra Chowdhury returns the compliment. I think Commodore Bani Marama has a very hard job. It's a hard job, but he's a brave man and uh, he's trying to get the country back on track, back on uh, you know, a stable footing. We all want law and order in this country. We cannot have a coup, we cannot have terrorists running this country. To understand what's happening in Fiji, one needs to grasp a simple fact. That for all the talk of Fijian fears of being dominated by the Indians, the British brought to work here in the mid-1800s, Indians are merely scapegoats for a power struggle between the Fijians themselves. The three coups were essentially triggered by shadowy groups of elite Fijians lunging for the spoils of power, their poorly educated kin hoodwinked into blind support. That's certainly what happened in 2000, the renegade businessman George Spate masking his own ambition by telling the world it was all about Indians threatening the Fijian way of life. We don't think the same, we don't eat the same food, we don't wear the same traditional clothing. Spate's particular target at the time was Mahendra Chowdhury, who'd endured 56 days of captivity in the nation's parliament with much of his cabinet. He did so with dignity and courage, helping to convince many that he more than deserves the top job. He threatened to kill me and I said, you can go ahead and do it, but I, I'm, I'm not resigning. And then, uh, no. So uh, they tried to, um, to intimidate me, to terrify me, you know, to, to, to get me to submit. Uh, but I'm made of stronger stuff than that. He was roughed up twice, I have to confirm that. But beaten uh, in the sense in what that term suggests, right. definitely not. Well, yes, they uh, damaged this knee. I had to get surgery done on it, uh, done on it in Australia <laughs> a year later. Uh, and uh, there was also a cracked rib on the uh, left-hand side. You were the democratically elected Prime Minister of Fiji and you were being beaten by a mob of thugs. Yes. Thanks to Baini Marama, in the end, Spate lost. The military and police didn't join the uprising. He was captured, brought to trial, and sentenced to life imprisonment for treason. Yet while he languishes like Napoleon on the small island of Nukalau off Suva, the true story behind the coup has never been told until now. Now you were one of the chief conspirators, weren't you? Yes, Graham. In fact, you recruited George Spate. A day before the takeover. Today, the remarkable story of Matthew Navakasua Sua convicted bomber and hostage taker, speaking out from the relative safety of Australia where he's seeking refuge. He spent three years in jail for his role in the events of 2000 and is now breaking a six-year cone of silence to reveal what really happened. George Pitt, he didn't know anything. He just came in the 11th hour. He's a fall guy, is that what you're saying? Yes, to be our mouthpiece to be our leader on that special, specific appointed time. So you're saying the whales got away and the sardine ended up in a can? Yes, definitely, yes. Not all laws are correct, or not all laws are right. Some laws are, laws are wrong. In the heart of Spate territory in Tai Levu, we confront the man Matthew Navakasuasua maintains was the biggest whale of all. He's Ilyasa Duvulovo, a vocal indigenous activist and leader of the Nationalist Party. Having served time for a relatively minor role in the 2000 coup, Duvulovo is now free, 
and is contesting this election with the same strident message against the Indians. I'm told you are the mastermind of the coup. Of the coup? Yeah. Well, the investigation is not over. That's what everybody are blaming me, especially the commander. Were you the mastermind of 2000, the coup? I don't believe so. On all counts, Duvu Lotho's denials are less than emphatic. No, did, did you tell Navaka Suasua to recruit Spade? No, Navaka Suasua came later. He says that on the morning of the coup, May the 19th, he came to your place and George Spate was there. <coughs> on the morning of the coup? Yeah. I can't recall. The but were you the coup mind. mastermind? No, I don't think so. What would I do? But emphatic about Duvu Lotho's guilt isn't just Matthew Navaka Suasua, but the man Australia sent to prosecute the coup leaders. Peter Ridgway went to Fiji as Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions with a specific brief to track down the conspirators, but was expelled last year when he evidently got too close. A leading figure, a dominant figure in the genesis was uh, Iliesu Duvu Lotho. The leader of the Nationalist Party. The leader of the Nationalist Party. He was vocal, vigorous, he was one of the organisers and he was a dominant figure in the execution of the coup. Two of Fiji's most prominent indigenous businessmen have now been dragged into these allegations. The first is Wati Soninata, who heads the strategic air service company at Nandi Airport. The second is Navitalai Naisoro, the head of Western Union in Fiji, and a close advisor to Prime Minister Garase. And you absolutely swear that they were behind the 2000 coup? This is the truth, Graham. I was there. I've been there, I've done it, and these people were with me all along. In Fiji, Navaka Suasua's account is being taken seriously. So much so that Nata and Naisoro were last week taken in for questioning by the police. They've been interviewed and uh, we will be in, in due course presenting to the DPP our brief of evidence and then he will adjudicate us to the sufficiency or otherwise of the evidence and charges may arise from that. Nata and Naisoro have yet to make public statements on these allegations. Although Navaka Suasua has given the police a statement, he isn't keen to return to Fiji, for he's been told that Navatilai Naisoro has made a specific threat against his life. The allegation has come from another of the coup conspirators, Joe Wangambatha, who, in the topsy-turvy manner of Fiji politics, is now an election candidate for Mahendra Chowdhury, the man he once held hostage. He told me that Matthew the moment he lands in Fiji, he's got a gang ready to slit his uh, throat. That's so what Nisoro specifically told you that? He told me that. You think he'd be killed if he comes back? Yes, definitely. Well, he has information that would take a lot of people down. And, and uh, because of uh, that information, he is a threat to a lot of people, uh, to the opportunists. Would they kill him? I, uh, I can't say that. Mm. But he would certainly be a threat. And they would go all out to ensure that he doesn't continue with his, uh, with his uh, stories. What undoubtedly places Matthew Navaka Suasua most at risk is his remarkable account of the complicity in the 2000 uprising of politicians who are still at the centre of government, cabinet ministers in the current Garase administration. Some of them, like the Minister for Transport and Civil Aviation, have already served prison terms for coup-related activities. But today, the finger is pointed at new faces, the Minister for Fisheries and Forests and the Minister for Works and Energy. Then, fresh allegations against the former military spokesman, now working for the UN in the Middle East. And most intriguing of all, the leader of the 1987 coups and former Prime Minister, Sitiveni Rambuka. Uh, well, it is known that uh, he was a person of interest to our uh, investigators. Um, uh, that's, that's common knowledge. That investigation's proceeding? Uh, that's, uh, we're consulting with the DPP on that. The file's open? Yes. When do you expect the DPP to make a dis determination on uh, that? Very one? soon, we understand. To understand the full picture of how deep this conspiracy goes, 
We need to go back to 1999, the year Mahendra Chowdhury first won office. Were you aware, as the chief investigator into the events of 2000, that the year before in 1999, the then head of the nationalist movement, Sakyusa Butendroka, had asked Frank Bani Marama to carry out a coup then? No, I wasn't aware of that. Yes, he did. He did? Yes. It was, uh, uh, it was the day after the Labour government was uh, sworn in, and he turned up uh, in my office. But it, it was basically to tell, come and tell me to remove the Chaudhary government. And I said that was not going to happen. Something else happened in 1999. Chowdhury's opponents got the means to wreak havoc when they recruited Matthew Navaka Suasua, then an explosives expert at the Emperor Gold Mines. So these were Emperor explosives and detonators? Yes. You stole them? Uh, um, uh, yes. <laughs> well, uh, because I. I had the keys for the magazine store. Right from the start, the nationalists were intent on dislodging the Chowdhury government. What hasn't been revealed until now is an extraordinary attempt in 1999, a full year before the spate coup, to stage a popular uprising under cover of darkness in the streets of Suva. I was assigned to uh, uh, go down to Lani, uh, power station in 1999 to blow the big transformer there. Uh, the plan was to cause a big blackout to the city of Suwa. As soon as that happened, according to Navaka Suwa Suwa, a mob would rampage through the streets of the capital, causing the kind of damage that would eventually occur a year later. That was the plan, to justify the actions of uh, the military to intervene. So you guys were trying to get the military to intervene right. by causing mayhem on the streets of Suva. That's, that's the plan of it. But according to Navaka Suwa Suwa, he'd been given the wrong information and blew up the wrong transformer. Who in the military knew about this? I was told by Navitali Naisoro that uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Filippo Tarakinkini would intervene as soon as we uh, caused that uh, big uprising. Tarakini Kini was the dashing face of the military to the world during the 2000 coup, justifying its decision not to side with Spate. Many in Fiji have wanted to ask him about his precise role in the events of 2000, but he's currently out of reach working for the United Nations in the Middle East. Why isn't he back here facing an investigation over this? Well, uh, he just doesn't want to come back. What, you've asked him to? We've, we've told his lawyers that he needs to come back and answer, answer questions and answer charges. Do you think it's strange the UN has given him a job? It is, after, after all our participation in the United Nations peacekeeping areas. In the Middle East? In the Middle East. And one of your fugitives is over there on the UN payroll. Yes, sir. Mm. But as Alice famously said, it gets curiouser and curiouser, not least the alleged involvement in the conspiracy of two current government ministers who've never been brought to justice. There was, there was later plotting for a coup to have occurred in April of 2000, a month before the May coup. And, there uh, was? There was. And in that um, planning, there was discussion of, of uh, Molotov cocktails being used and thrown around the streets of Suva, the Westpac and the Anzid Bank being torched in order to bring out um, street riots and to incite uh, a breakdown of law and order. Around this time, claims Matthew Navaka Suwa Suwa, he saw the current Minister for Fisheries and Forests in the Garase government, Konisi Yambaki, at a gathering where coup plans were being discussed. I was surprised to see Konisi Yambaki there. I asked uh, Joe Wangabala about it. Uh, and uh, Joe Wangabala told me, don't worry about it, he's, he's one of us. I know Kanisi Yambaki, but, but in terms of his being linked to these events, uh, that's new to me. And it's a serious allegation. You can't take that sort of allegation lightly. And, and you would think, responsibly, that uh, now appraised of it, the Fiji police would, would want to take that on board. 
But there's another current member of the Garase cabinet whose alleged role in 2000 evidently escaped the attention of the deposed chief prosecutor, Savanatha Dranindalo, a former military officer, now Minister for Works and Energy. Were you aware that Savanatha Dranindalo was actually the nationalist's choice to carry out the coup before George Spade? No, I wasn't. That's, that's another piece of new information that I find fascinating, but, uh, but it's new to me. You didn't know that he was told to wait in the Holiday Inn Hotel no. and be summoned to the Parliament? No, I didn't. No, that's news to me. He's a man. He was a man. Uh, he was on standby when the time we took over the Parliament. He was waiting here on the morning of the coup? Yeah. Oh, and that's, that's and that he true. was meant to be the mastermind of the whole thing? I don't know. As he, as was I meant, he was meant to carry it out, not George. Is that right? I don't really know. Mm. But maybe Nebogososua has more information. What happened in the end? Uh, he decided to, to leave us because uh, well, as soon as he see the, the mats and the, all the lootings and uh, breaking in of uh, uh, shops in the cities, uh, he must have thought, uh, no, this is, the, this is not the right place for me. And he took off? Took off. So from that, George Peter, uh, bulldozed his way in and became leader. May 19th, 2000, the day of the coup. The conspirators gathered at the home of Ilyesa Duvulovo, the nationalist leader. I went over to his place. I, I could see George Peter's uh, face. Uh, he was um, worrying about something. And he said, no, we can't do this because the boys are drunk. Some of the boys are drunk. Was Spade at your house? Were some well, of the boys as drunk? As I said, you know. Uh, this is what he says. Yeah, no, not in my house. There was no, nobody in my house. I, was, I, live, I live in uh, Raggy Avenue. Mm. That could be my office, I think. Right. Because my office is separate. But by now, the die was cast. Drunk or sober, the assault on the parliament began. The mobile phone records speak for themselves. On the day of the coup, when Spate and his gunmen entered the parliament, in very short order, they got Chowdhury on his knees, they tied their hands up with gaffer tape or whatever, and Chowdhury was on his knees in front of Spate with a gun to his head, and Spate was on the phone. He was on his mobile phone and he made a whole series of phone calls to one phone number, and that was Ilyesa Duvaloto's mobile phone. The leader of the Nationalist the Party. The leader of the Nationalist Party. And at the very time those calls were being made, Ilyesa Duvaloto and a number of other failed candidates from the 99 election were holding hands, walking down the main street of Suva, singing nationalist patriotic war songs and, uh, um, and announcing that they were going to take the parliament. Right, so that march and George Spate entering the parliament were a simultaneous action. Totally linked. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm just flat. <laughs> but is it true? Yeah. No, no. I, 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 I was seen the march, you know. Mm. The march was... But were you the my... coup mastermind? No, I don't think so. Fiji burnt that day. 13 years of hard work to recover from the previous coups went up in smoke. Justice is yet to be fully served. Yet the man who goes to the polls this week seeking re-election wants to pardon all the coup conspirators, whether convicted or not. To understand why he might want to do so, take a look at this man, Simeone Kaitani, so close to George Spate in 2000, he calls for a round of applause. Kaitani was eventually charged with taking an oath of office in Spate's illegal government, but was acquitted when there was no video record to prove he'd done so. In the buildings behind, ministers in a democratically elected government were being held at gunpoint. An Indo-Fijian prime minister was being beaten. Well, he was very prominent uh, uh, during uh, our uh, you know incarceration here i believed him to be uh, you know one of the mob where's kaitani now well at the right hand of lysenia and garase the current leader 
minister in the Prime Minister's office. Have you been tempted to stage a coup yourself? No, I have not. Uh, but uh, throughout uh, the last five years, uh, the military has, uh, has been the bastion of law and order to ensure that, that, this, that this country remains uh, peaceful um, and provides security for the people of this nation. Uh, so we've, we've moved away from that. But if not a coup maker, then certainly a ferocious watchdog, determined to enforce the will of the people with the gun. The people who have been critical of Commodore Baini Marama must understand where he's coming from. He's a guarantor of democracy. Yes. Rather than... If we don't have law and order here, we won't have democracy. As we've seen, many of the big fish in Fiji seem to have got away, leaving the small ones caught in the net. George Spate must rue the day he allowed himself to become the biggest catch. So it comes as no surprise to learn of a sea change on the part of the stooge with the swagger doing life for bringing Fiji to its knees. One day he called me and I met, just come, uh, I want to tell you something. I have regretted what I've done. What we did was wrong. The spate told you that? The spate told me that. At senior level, the military and police in Fiji are united in their determination that the country's coup culture will finally be broken. But regrettably for everyone, that doesn't guarantee there won't be trouble in the days and weeks ahead. It's 